Amen. All right, Psalm 10. One of the things that we see in Psalm 10, you know, as I've mentioned, I've been mentioning, there's a, there's a common theme that seems to be uh, with each individual psalm, there's kind of one major theme that, that is uh, permeating throughout the psalm. And this one is a common theme in multiple psalms. And it's one that seems to be being lost from, from the Christian, the, the, the overall, say, Christian mind. And it just simply has to do with wicked people calling on God for their judgment and for their you know, help on them, and then God bringing judgment upon these wicked people, and that this being something that a, a godly person does, is seeking the Lord for help and seeking the Lord to bring judgment on wicked people and wicked doers, and, and you know, wanting to have that justice executed. I don't know why this is such a problem these days. People are, will, will, you know, take what I'm saying and say like, oh, that's so unchristian and oh, what a bad attitude. And they, just, they just don't know their Bible very well at all. This is something that was very commonplace and very well understood because it's something that's just, you don't even have to believe in God to have the sense of justice and judgment when people do wicked things, they, they deserve to be punished, and it's a good thing to have judgment brought down upon really wicked people. But people have gotten so soft lately, it's just, it's kind of like they, they've taken this, this real bad extreme of, of having this, this snowflake soft attitude towards just everything. Now look, I, I know we're all sinners. And that is, a, that is a fact, of course that is, but be careful with taking anything just, just way off into some extreme that is not biblical. We see oh, so much scripture about judgment and God judging and, bringing, and, and, and this being a positive thing. It's a good thing. Hey, when you're being persecuted, and, and you know what, I think part of the reason is because People have stopped living a Christian life. They, they, they believe in God and they give lip service to God. And they say how great Christians they are. But because they're not really in the word, because they don't even know what these scriptures say, they don't even know what the Bible teaches, they're not living their life according to the Bible. So they're not experiencing any of the persecution that this is more foreign to people, especially in the United States, where, in general, there, there isn't much persecution anyways. And the only persecution you're going to find are, are against people who are really living a separated, sold-out life for the Lord anyways. All of your mild Christianity are suffering, like, zero persecution. And when that's the case, you know, th what we've seen happen is people have just kind of gotten soft on this whole... And, and, you know, the other part, aspect of that, too, is... When a lot of people don't want to have any judgment, oftentimes it's because they're involved with a lot of sin. And that's understandable, too. Look, when I was living a completely worldly life as a saved person, I didn't want to bring up anything about the Bible because I wasn't listening to it. I wasn't following it. So who am I to say anything, right? I mean, you don't want to be a hypocrite. At least, I mean, some people don't. I didn't want to be a hypocrite, so I didn't bring up very much. I didn't talk about Jesus. I didn't talk about the Lord, because here I am just going off in all kinds of sin. And what you're going to find is then when people hear that judgment, you could respond a few different ways. You could either hear it and go, look at yourself and go, like, oh, man, you know what I need? This. That's right. This is right. This is, this, is, this is the Word of God, and the judgment is right and we need proper judgment, but I better get right myself. <laughs> yeah, I can't say anything about anyone else right now, but when I start, you know, that's why I need to get myself cleaned up, straightened out, and get this sin out of my life, because people need to hear the truth. We need to have judgment. We need to have righteous judgment. And it can't come from someone who's just all off in their own sin anyway. So when people are off in their own sin, if they don't have that type of an attitude, they might just start getting this, oh, we'll just take it easy on them. I mean, we're all sinners, come on. Because they don't want judgment coming down on them, and they still want to continue living the way that they live. That's part of the problem. I, that's a whole thing in and of itself. And actually, this is a little bit 
of a rabbit trail off of where I wanted to get it to get you into anyways with this sermon. But I mean, that's just the general overview of this psalm in particular and many psalms to have the same type of just, just it's about joy. And this is a song, right? It's a song that is scripture, that is the word of God. And it starts off here in verse number one, why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thyself in times of trouble? So here we have, you know, through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, David basically calling out God and saying, God, where are you? Right? I, we're in trouble. We need help. The wicked is after us. Where are you, God? Don't hide yourself now. We need you. Right? This is, this is how the verse is starting off. And why is he calling on God? Because he wants God to step in and do something. He's not just saying, oh, well, they're just sinners too, and I'm sinners, so let's just not have anything happen to him. No, he's like, come, come help me. There are wicked people here. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. And this is when we're, you know, in, in a more um, focused sense in this passage, you're going to see a lot of references to the wicked and their pride. Pride is mentioned multiple times in this passage and the poor, the poor being the target. You have wicked people being referenced here. And, and the poor are the people that they're persecuting and trying to keep down and, and um, just doing all manner of evil against. Verse 2, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. And again, we've gone over this. I've gone over this in, in other psalms, the concept of, you know, people reaping what they've sown. And when you try to set traps for people, they're gonna, you're going to fall on them yourself. So I'm not going to get into that. But he's basically just, at, just saying, you know, asking God and saying, you know, these wicked people, they're persecuting the poor in their pride because they think they're so great. And see, when someone's lifted up with pride, they're full of themselves, right? So they're, they're haughty. They're puffed up. They, they think how great they are and they look down on other people. So who's the easiest target to look down? If you're thinking you're so great and you're comparing yourself among other people, who are you going to target? The poor. And it's usually people who are wealthy who get lifted up in pride because they've accumulated goods unto themselves and they think, I'm so much better than everyone else because I have more stuff than everyone else. That's the way the mindset works of people who are lifted up with pride. And, you know, there may be other things, too. Maybe they have some, some special talent or gift that makes them think that they're so much better. Well, I could sing so much better than everyone else. I can do, the, you know, wh whatever your talent is, whatever your ability is, I'm so much better. And instead of giving God the credit and humbly just saying, hey, I mean, it's not like I, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're given a gift, how can you boast of that gift? If your vocal cords somehow are able to hit some, you know, these great notes and be able to carry to, you know, do these things, that's not you. Or you've been given that. So how can you brag about that stuff? But see, people let this, they hear the praise or they have the goods or whatever it is, and it starts corrupting the, the, the right thought. It starts corrupting uh, um, the, the reality, which is, hey, God's blessed you. You've got this gift. Praise the Lord for that. And if people are giving you, um, you know, good remarks or looking up to you or, you know, you've received some wealth, praise God for his blessing. But not starting to think of yourself more highly than you ought to and start thinking that you're better than everyone else. So when people get lifted up with pride, one of the biggest targets, though, happens to just be poor people because they already are looking down on them as a lesser person. Well, you must be not nearly as good as I am because you don't have very much money. Because people have a standard of judging people based on how much wealth they have as opposed to the character of the person themselves. What's more important, the character or how much money they possess? There are so many people that are much better people than others that don't have any money compared to, compared to people who do have a lot of money, but they're, they're wicked, vile people. Verse number three, the Bible says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. Now, I'm just going to point out real quickly before we even go any further, because in verse three, in verse two, we have the wicked in his pride 
doth persecute the poor. Verse 3, the wicked boasteth. This is another, you know, proud attribute. Someone's boasting, someone's bragging. Look down at verse number um, 4, the wicked through the pride of his countenance. And then in verse number 6, he, he hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. You see all that, you know, how much this pride is just blinding this person um, that is being described here in this psalm over and over again. Being proud, boasting is brought up. And um, the Bible says about pride in, in Proverbs 21 4, and high look and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. And that's just having a high, you know, even just having a high look, right? You know, just, just having this pompous, puffed up, you know, given your whatever cool, if I'm not even good at being able to, to pretend at, at having some high look or something. I, if I tried, it would just be funny. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to have a whole bunch of people laughing at me right now at my attempt to make some cool face. But... Um, <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. You see the posters. You see the people. You see the, the magazine racks, you know, and these people with their proud looks, their high looks lifted up. These celebrities or whatever, these millionaires, you know, they give their real cool faces. And you know what? God hates that. And the Bible says it's a sin. The high look, even just, just giving off that persona, that look, that attitude, that you're this real proud person, is a sin. The high look, the proud heart, right, just being lifted up in yourself, it's a sin. The Bible says in Proverbs 6, 16, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Number one, a proud look. God hates it, and it's so bad, he says, it's an abomination. God really, really, really hates when man has a proud look. Why do you think that is? Because God knows Man, God knows every the, the person who's real full of themselves and thinks that they're so great, even if the uh, other people are deceived and think, wow, this person is just phenomenal, this person's great, and they're like, yeah, I am pretty good, right? I'm, I'm pretty good. God sees that, but he goes, I know everything that you've done. Who do you think you are to lift yourself up and to think that you are just such a great, like, I know all, I know everything you've done. I know your secret sins, I, whether other people know them or not. God knows everything that you've done. And you start elevating yourself above other people. You know, hey, look, we need to remain humble and understand that we, you know, you, the, the, the more you lift yourself up, the closer you're trying to get yourself to God. And God's saying, you don't belong anywhere close where I am. But I, we covered this, I think it was last week, we are talking about people who were actually thinking that they were God, right? Their heart gets so full of themselves and so lifted up, they actually think like, hey, I, I am a God. I have so much power and wealth. I'm a God. That's crazy. And this is, you know, this is the heart of wickedness. The Bible talks about a wicked generation in Proverbs chapter 30. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel 16. I just want, I want to show you that real quick, too, uh, just on this, this concept of pride. Because we see pride just brought up over and over again. Now, uh, one of the reasons why I'm going in depth in this, and I brought this up many times in the past, is of my very firm belief, and I think you're going to see this consistently throughout Scripture, is when the Bible talks about the wicked, when it's talking about the wicked as in, like, a group of people, I believe this is talking about reprobate people. Now, there are people who can do wicked things that are not reprobates. There are people who do things that the Bible will call as wickedness, and it's wicked, and it's wrong. But there's a difference, and this is why you just got to, when, when you're looking at the context of how the words are being used, and it's talking about people who are referred to as the wicked, I believe this is talking, especially in Psalms and Proverbs, are the, kind of the two main areas where you see this, the, the, that term, you know, over and over again. We're going to see attributes that you'll find elsewhere in Scripture that are identified completely with reprobates. So we're going to be looking a little bit at Romans 1 tonight as well, and you're going to see these shared attributes that when we see these verses about the wicked, the wicked in his pride. And there's a reason why pride comes up so many times in reference to these wicked people, because verse 2 of Psalm 10 says, the wicked, 
And it's referring to this group, this, the wicked in this pride, doth persecute the poor. It's a specific group of people, and, and, and as we get into this, you'll, you'll, you'll start to see how, how awesome the, the Word of God is and how consistent it is that, you know, and I didn't always know or believe in the reprobate doctrine, but having been confronted with it and, and hearing it and seeing it, you know, years ago, since that time, and, and then receiving it and going, yeah, because even at first I didn't, I didn't fully... You know, I saw a lot of it, but I didn't grasp it. Then, but then after getting it, it's like, you see, the more I study my Bible then continue to study my Bible, you see this, it's like, wow, how could you miss this? This is a common theme throughout Scripture. And I think it's, this is one of the reasons this, a misunderstanding of the reprobate doctrine is what's led way to so much false doctrine, even just on salvation, right? This is where you get, um, you know, Calvinists misunderstand the reprobate doctrine, People who think you could lose your salvation misunderstand the reprobate doctrine because they see these other verses that talk about people who are given up and given over, and you know they, they don't understand it. They think, oh, well, you just lose your salvation then. Right? It's like, no. It's not that you could lose your salvation. They never had it, and now they can't be saved. So, but when you see this throughout Scripture, it's like, man, this, this, this is everywhere. It's all over the place. This is a concept that is found just, just so many times throughout Scripture. So um, you are in Ezekiel 16. I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 30 for you just about this wicked generation that the Bible is talking about uh, that share these attributes of what we're reading in Psalm 10. Proverbs verse 30, or excuse me, chapter 30, verse number 11, about where there's a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. And any of you who know Romans 1, just be thinking about those passages in Romans 1, and you're going to see the, the consistencies even between what I'm reading here in Proverbs 30 with Romans 1. Disobedient to parents is in Romans chapter 1, and here we have there's a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. Right? No respect for their parents. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. These are people who have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Right? There's a lot of people who are reprobate, they're real spiritual, but they're not believing in the Lord. They're not believing in God. They're pure in their own eyes. They think that they're so great, right? and this goes along with also being proud, but they're not washed from their filthiness. Verse 13, there's a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes. They're so full of themselves, they're so lifted up, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives. It's interesting, because this is the same generation that the Proverbs is talking about. They think they're so great while their teeth are like swords, right? While they're out devouring and destroying people, yet they still think they're so great. And they're doing harm and persecuting the poor and, and trampling on people, but they still have this, this lofty, lifted up view of themselves. It's so perverted and twisted. That's the wicked mind. There's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. As we get into Psalm 10, you'll start to see more of the persecution of the poor also coming up, continuing to come up in this psalm. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to, to go through Proverbs 30 because it's the same stuff. You've got people who are proud, lifted up, full of themselves, persecuting the poor. Ezekiel 16 Verse number 49, the Bible says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, number one, pride. Fullness of bread and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So what do we have? Pride, a people full of pride, and they're doing nothing to help the poor and needy. They're, they're persecuting the poor and needy. The Bible says, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. And it's just kind of funny, you know, the, what we received our strike on on YouTube for was at, at the Atlanta Pride Parade, right? Children of Pride was, a, I preached on a sermon called the Children of Pride. And, hmm, no surprise that they don't want to have that message getting out. Because when you have a group of wicked people who are identifying themselves and, and they're, they're 
just glorying in their pride so much that they just, they just call their events pride. It's not even like gay pride anymore, it's just pride, right? And if you're going to identify yourself as a group and you're just going to say, if we're going to put one label on ourselves, it's pride, right? Whatever we do, our big event, it's pride. You have to be a fool and blind and so ignorant having never read your Bible to think that there's anything good or acceptable with that at all when the stamp is just pride. Pride, the one thing, you know, the main thing that just leads people completely away, the, the thing that gets people reprobate, right? Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened in Romans chapter 1. When they, when they make to them, themselves own gods, you know, that they reject the Lord, it's their pride that draws them away from the Lord, and they think they're so great and lifted up in themselves. I had you turn, yeah, we just read from Ezekiel 16, pride was what led to Sodom, the Sodomites, committing their filthy, abominable acts which is why they were then, why God saw that it was good to take them away. Now, we all know what happened in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So how did God take them away? He didn't, he didn't just, like, put them off somewhere. He didn't just place them in, you know, even a prison and just have them get arrested. He didn't just move them from the land of Sodom into some other land, off on some island somewhere, like Australia. Just, he didn't just dump them. No, when he said to take them away, he rained fire and brimstone on them and destroyed them and burned them up and, and sent them straight to hell. That's what the Bible says when he says God took them away. And you know what? The Bible says that God saw that, therefore I took them away as I saw good. It was a good thing. It was good for God to take them away the way that he did. And it was because they had committed, it says, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me, therefore. See, I've had people turn to Ezekiel 16 and say, oh, no, no, the real sin was their pride. Yeah, that is, that's where it all stemmed from. But that's not why, it, it, God didn't just destroy them because of their pride. If you keep reading, they committed the abomination and then God saw that it was good to take them away. Because people just try, they, they want to downplay homosexuality as, oh, well, that's not really. They were different types of homos, right? They, they weren't these really bad ones, you know, the, um, you know whatever. They, <laughs> they want to say it's something else, that the reason why they get destroyed is because they were a different type of homo than any homo. And it's like, no, when they're committing these abominations, God decided, you know, it's good to get, to get rid of this cancer from off the land. Uh-oh, hate speech again. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read from, uh, if you want to turn, turn to, um, turn to Romans chapter 1. Having a high look, being proud, being lifted up is, is mentioned all throughout the Bible. It's, uh, it's always bad, right? It's never a good thing to just be proud and lifted up. Psalm 101 talks about this a little bit too. Verse number 3, the Bible reads, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. So here we have the reference to the wicked person. That's why I'm, you know, another reason I'm bringing this up, because you have the wicked person, and then in the next verse, whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. These, these wicked people are associated with having this high heart. Ro uh, Romans chapter 1, verse number 28. And before we get into that real quick, I'm going to reread... Um, verse number 3 from Psalm 10. We're going to read verse number 28 and, and just, again, look at all the different um, attributes that we see of someone who's given over to a reprobate mind. And in, so, in Psalm 10, verse 3, the Bible reads, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, there's that pride, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. So, 
the wicked, not only are they proud and lifted up, not only are they persecuting the poor, but then they bless the covetous, right? People who want things that they can't have, people who have this desire and, and seek after things that, that they can't have themselves, that are covetous after other people's goods, other people's property, other people's spouses, or whatever. They want things that don't belong to them, things that they can't have, and they have a covetous heart, a greedy heart that just wants more. The wicked blesses those people. Why? Because they're just like them. Romans 1, verse 28, the Bible says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, look at this, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. It goes on and on. Jump down to verse number 32 because it continues on with that list. And it says, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same. So these people who are given over to reprobate mind, people who are filled with all this stuff, including covetousness, they're filled with covetousness. They know that the judgment of God is death. Not only do they do these things, it says, but have pleasure in them that do them. So they're guilty of it, but you know what? They also just have pleasure in other people that are just like them and are doing wicked things just like them. They bless the covetous because they're full of covetousness. So they see someone else full of covetousness. And instead of, you know, having judgment or condemning that, they go, no, no, you're just like me. Bless you. They have blessings on that person. The Bible says in Isaiah 5.20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto that person. The, the other thing I want to point out, turn back to Psalm 10. Psalm 10, verse 3 again, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom... The Lord abhorreth. There's, a, there's a, a, a word there called whom. Now, I'm not an English major or an expert, but I think I know enough that when a word like who or whom is used, it's in reference to an actual person. Am I wrong about that? Now, if you use a word like that, or which it can be in reference to inanimate objects it could be referred to maybe sometimes as people but but it's much more ambiguous but if you use the word who or whom is that ambiguous or are we actually talking about a person here why am i taking the time to, to, to we know it says who or whom because it says whom the lord abhorreth which means hates and abhor is a strong word for hate so whom this is talking about a person that god hates well, God doesn't hate God as love. Whom the Lord abhorreth. What part of whom don't you understand? Or abhorreth, don't you understand? Or the Lord, don't you understand? It's very simple English. Just accept it. It's Bible. Whom the Lord abhorreth. There are people that God hates. It's a fact. Deal with it. How about you start loving God's word, too, by the way, instead of trying to, to you make excuses for it or not believe it. Just accept it and move forward. Whom the Lord abhorreth. Now, it says, who is it that it says, the covetous, comma, whom the Lord abhorreth. Right? The people are full of covetousness. God hates those people. And the reason why it's bringing that up is because the wicked is blessing the covetous. They're blessing the person that God hates. Why is this being brought up? Because you're not supposed to be blessing someone that God hates. Simple teaching. Again, though, we have people today who just want to bless everyone. 
God bless America, God bless the world, God bless everything. No, 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 you don't just bless everybody. Okay, there, there's, a, you know, there's blessings and there's cursings, and there's blessings that, that should go on people that you ought to bless. It's not just a blanket, you don't just bless everybody. That's why it's even being mentioned here, like, why are you blessing the person that God hates? You know, people say, oh, God bless Israel. What? Why would you ask God to bless a people that have completely rejected Jesus Christ? Why would you want a blessing on them? The way that God deals with people is that when they're turned from him, you want God to bring down some type of judgment on them because you want them to be brought low and to be humbled enough to seek the Lord. God, from Genesis to Revelation, God is always trying, when, when people turn their back on him, when people turn away from the Lord, when people do things and go after strange gods, he's going to bring judgment for the purpose of bringing them back to him. If you actually care about and love the people, love the children of Israel, and love the Jews, if you love these people, you're not going to just say, bless them when they reject Christ. Because it's better for them to, to not have a blessing and to be made humble and brought low and then receive Christ than it is to just try to bring blessing upon them and lift them up even more. Why would you want to do that? It, it's, it's not right. It's not biblical. And do you think God is loving the antichrists, the people who just, just complete? No. Now, anyone who's not given over to reprobate mind, God wants them saved. But you're not going to accomplish that by just bless everybody. Let's keep reading here, verse number four. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So when it says the wicked, again, through his pride, it's because of his pride, he doesn't want to seek after God. So it says he will not. That it's not, it's not, it doesn't say he shall not. It says he will not. He doesn't want to. Through his own pride, he doesn't even want to seek God. He wants to have nothing to do with God. God is not in all his thoughts. Romans 1, 28, you don't have to turn it, we already looked at it. It says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind and do those things which are not convenient. So when people get lifted up in pride, again, the wicked, and we see these attributes, they're full of pride. They don't even want to have God in all of their thoughts. This matches perfectly with Romans 1 when God says, you know what? You don't want to have anything to do with me? Fine, I don't want to have anything to do with you then. You've made your choice. We're done. Done. And then he gives them over to this reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, which don't come naturally. They, that's why they do sins that are against nature. Because while we all have a sin nature, and we all will sin because of that sin nature, when people start committing sins, that are against nature, even contrary, different from our sin, they just start going off in a weird perversion, that's just a sign that God's given them over that reprobate mind to start doing those things that are not convenient, that are not natural, that are not normal. Verse 5 of uh, Psalm 10, His ways are always grievous. The ways of the wicked, they're always grievous. Right? They're cause, causing grief. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. So God's judgments, you know, they, they can't even understand. They're so far above the wicked out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. Verse 6, he hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. This is, again, the proud of the wicked person. Nothing, nothing's going to happen to me. They think that they're invincible. Verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. And don't just pass over these attributes of the wicked person. His mouth is full of cursing. Filthy mouth, not just filthy because they're using like curse words, but like cursing people. 
wishing bad on people and deceit and fraud. So they, 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 de they deceive, they're full of guile, and they trick people and fraud. And it says, under his tongue is mischief and vanity. They're out to just do damage and harm. Verse number eight, he sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. Again, we see that the poor being referenced here as being the target. And verse eight, three times it's talking about them doing things in secret. Just notice all the secrecy there. He sits in a, you know, what's a lurking place? It's like being in the shadows, right? You're kind of, you're kind of lurking and watching out and scoping out and spying out someone that you're going to do harm to. So they're, they're sitting in these lurking places. In the secret places, they're murdering the innocent. Behind closed doors, or you know, they're, they're doing this stuff in secret. And his eyes are privily, so privately they're set against, but all, publicly they're going to be saying all manner of good to the poor, right? But inwardly, privately, they hate them. And they're setting traps for the poor, and they're setting traps for people. So this stuff, these wicked people, they don't just come out in the open with it. That would be self-destructive. I mean, of course they're not going to do that. Nobody's going to just be so... Now, they may be out and proud with their sin, but they're not going to just come out and just be like, oh yeah, and I'm setting these traps and I'm trying to harm people and I'm trying to defile little kids. You think they're really going to come out and say that? No. But you know what? The Bible teaches us the truth about these people. That they are doing that. But, you know, this world would, it would just have you believe that, oh no, no, don't worry about what the Bible says. I mean, come on. We, I asked them. They don't do those things. Oh, okay, good. I'm glad. I'm glad that they said that they're not going to harm any little children. Because, you know, they would tell you if they, if they were. Verse 9, he lieth in wait secretly. Again, the secrecy. As a lion in his den, he lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. Again, the poor being targets. Now, there's lots of traps that are set for the poor. And I came up with this list that I kind of want to get through. I try not to spend too much time on all this, but I really started thinking about the, this, um, what's being taught here in this passage is that you've got, on one hand, the wicked people, they're full of pride, they, they, they're full of themselves, and they're targeting the poor people. How do we see this playing out today? Well, people who are really wicked and full of pride, as I mentioned before, oftentimes have a lot of money and a lot of power. Right? This is where you're going to find the largest percentage of people who fit this category are going to be in these positions of high power and high money. And these are the people who are targeting the poor. And there's many traps that are set out for the poor. And see, it wouldn't be a trap if it was just obvious, if they just made it obvious, like, no, yeah, I'm trying to just totally screw you over and, and do bad and do harm and do evil to you. No, they're going to try to make it sound like they're benefiting the poor. So where do we see traps like this set up? Uh, I just came up with a short list of a few things that to me just kind of seem obvious. Uh, one of them is through usury. Things like, we say, what do you mean by usury? Usury is where you charge interest on someone when you make a loan to them. Now, who needs loans other than people who are poor? I mean, if you're rich, you don't need a loan, right? You already have the money. You're not going and asking to borrow money. People who are poor are the ones who are the going out and, and saying, hey, you know, I need to have this, I need to have this, or I need to get some food, you know, and you're asking for some money, you know, to borrow a little bit of money to help you get by with what you need, and what the, the wicked will do then is turn around and charge interest on that. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 7, you could turn if you want to uh, Leviticus 25, Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with it. You could have money if you've been blessed by God. There's nothing wrong just with having goods. That is not in and of itself sinful. But what you're going to find is a lot of people who have goods, like Jesus said, How hardly shall they that are rich... Uh, see the kingdom of God, right? They're, 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 
because those are the people who mostly are full of themselves and are lifted up with pride. Their pride blinds them from accepting the free gift of salvation, the free gift of God. They'd rather trust in themselves, trust in their money, trust in their riches, trust in all those things, as opposed to just trusting in the Lord for anything, because they think they can do it all on their own. So when you, and this is just a good principle to know, just understand anyways, I think everyone understands this, but you know, when you borrow from someone, then you have a debt and you owe them, and that makes you a servant to whoever you borrowed from, right? But when the lender is wicked and wants to charge interest, they're going to keep you down even longer because what happens is, they say, well, I need to borrow, let's say, like, like 20 bucks or whatever. And they say, okay, well, I'll give you 20 bucks now, but you got to pay me 25 bucks. It's like you didn't have the 20 bucks to begin with. You're already not in a good position. You're already not doing very well. It's going to be hard enough just to pay that back, but then now you're expected to pay even more back to that person that keeps you down. And it, look, this is a good reason, just real simple understanding. Don't get in debt. Do everything you can to not get in debt because it's going to make you a servant to the lender. As much as you can, pay with what you have and, and nothing more and don't go into these debts and become servants if you don't have the money. This is where, and, and it gets really bad in instances like the payday loans. Don't ever get involved with that. Because that, those, they're like, I mean, you, that, those are like loan sharks. They have these ridiculously high percentages that they take a cut out of, like 20%, 25%, whatever. I mean, thank God there's some kind of laws that limit how high people can charge interest on. But, I mean, really, you shouldn't be charging interest at all you know, and, and at least as God's people, you know, if someone is, you know, we're commanded actually to give, to like to help people out and, and to help out the poor. And especially like your brother in Christ, you ought never to charge. Like if someone in church is, is on hard times and they ask to borrow some money. And if you're inclined to be able to lend to that person, don't ever charge them interest. Don't ever do it. I don't care what the world's doing. You are wicked and not right with God if you're charging interest on your brother in Christ, brother or sister in Christ, that is, that is in a time of need and you don't just help them out. Right? Then stay away from that stuff. The payday loan, I mean, you don't even have enough money. And, but see, this is, if people were getting, if the poor were getting paid every day for the work that they were doing, you wouldn't need the payday loans, right? This goes back to my other sermon on, on, on that. Like, Lord, hey, when the person works, give them their pay. Give them their hire, especially because especially the poor person, they're going to need it. They need that money right away. So they don't have to go to places. You don't have this system set up where it's like, I've been working and working and working. I've been working for two weeks. Oh, wait, but payday is until next week. So now you're going to work for three weeks, and that whole week you've worked, it's, it's always lagging, right? They never pay you in advance. It's always going to be in arrears. It's like, okay, yeah, well, you've worked now an extra week. I mean, even in my job, it's like this. I don't remember when my, I don't know, I think I get paid this week, but like, or whatever, right? Let's, let's say I get paid this week on Friday. Well, I've already worked. So I'm not getting paid for the wor this week. I'm getting paid for the last two weeks. And I've already just been working, and they're holding on to that money until the next two weeks, Right? And it's, you know, that's just the way our system works, but it's ungodly. It's not right. And you wouldn't have these people going these payday loans if they were getting paid every day. Why would you need a loan? I'm like, no. But see, because they have to wait so long, but they need to eat today, that's why they go this way. But then it turns into this whole cycle. Because they're, then they're always going to the payday loan until they can try to, to, to earn enough to pay back so much that where they don't need to be in that cycle anymore. And, that, and that's hard to do. Once you get, once you get, you know, put down, you know, you turn into one, it's one small thing that can turn you to, to have to borrow even more money. And then it's even more interest. And now it's just that, you know, these, this hole gets dug even deeper and it's so hard to climb out of that. Watch out for that. Leviticus 25, verse 35, the Bible reads, And if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. Thou shalt relieve him, is what the Bible says. And your brother's waxen poor and in decay, 
relieve him, help him. Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him or increase, but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. Now there's nothing wrong with expecting to be paid back when you lend to someone. But the, 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 the sin is when you're saying, well, I gave you 20, give me 25. I gave you this food, you give me more back. That's wicked. You don't, don't practice that. Proverbs 28.8 the Bible reads, He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. See, God's going to end up making things work out. So the person who's using unjust means to get money from people, and one of those unjust means is, is, is by charging interest and charging usury on people. There's obviously other ways of getting unjust gain. But he's saying, you know what, those people who are, who are thinking they're, they're winning and they're getting all this extra money to increase their substance, the Bible says, you know what, he's just gathering it for him that's going to pity the poor. So the person who's actually going to give and lend, God's going to take care of you for that. The Bible says that whosoever, you know, when you, when you lend to someone, it's not, you're, you're lending it unto the Lord. When you, when you have pity on the poor and you lend to the poor, the Bible says that, that you're lending, it's like you're lending unto the Lord and that God's going to recompense, God will pay you. You don't even have to worry about getting paid back because God will see what you're doing, and he likes that, and he likes when you have that heart and that spirit of helping out your brother in need, and he says, I'll take care of that. And I don't know about you, but I'd much rather, I'd much rather be, you know, wanting God to pay me back for something like that even than the person I lent to. It's almost like you want to lend to someone and be like, yeah, it's okay, just don't, <laughs> don't, don't pay me back because I know that God will, will recompense for that. He's promised to do it. What a great blessing. What a great blessing to give, right? But you're not going to give if you're full of pride. Why? Because you think that you're so great. Why, why should I give to this person, right? They're lower than I am. I, pff, they don't deserve it. I deserve it because I'm so great. See, and they're going to they're gonna then say, yeah, they're actually so low, <laughs> I'm going to charge them interest on this and take even more from them. I'm going to squeeze them for every penny I can. That's wicked. And God sees that stuff, and you know what? God's going to right all the wrongs. So that's one of the traps is, is usury, that, that people who are wicked and proud and lifted up Will, will oppress the poor with. It's a huge one. How about another one is, turn if you would to Proverbs 28. If you haven't already, turn to Proverbs 28. Another trap on the poor people is actually done through our government, and I believe that's through welfare and through these programs that try to give money unto people who don't work. And it's a plague. And, and, you know, there's a, and, and, you know, this is a whole sermon in and of itself. When you, when you give to people, see, it, the government should have no business in taking people's money and then just distributing it to other people. There's no business doing that. Because, one, obviously, you know, the government is not efficient in anything that it does. There is no real oversight. When you've got people just managing someone else's money, it's not their money. What do they care? Oh, yeah, sure, you could have this. You give it away. You know. There's no motivation to even, to even watch over it. At least when you have churches responsible for charity and for helping people out, you know, even if it's not churches, it's anybody, any group or organ, you know, someone who's just doing it on their own, they can at least have the oversight to say, yeah, I'm not going to just give a person this money who's not even willing to work. Like, they're completely capable of working, but they just don't want to do it. No, I'm not, I'm not paying for you. You're not, you're not going to be another one of my children and just, you know, because even my children, you know, uh, yeah, I'm going to take care of them, but they're expected to work and, do their, and, and hold their own around the house. 
I love my children enough to teach them right and to teach them how to work. You think I'm going to just work, get all my hard-earned money that I'm going off and spending away from my family and working when there's other things that I could be doing with my time, but no, I'm going to go and work hard and just give all that to you who doesn't even want to want to do any work for yourself? No. Because if I do that, here's the thing, if I do that, I'm not helping that person at all. I may help them temporarily in a very short term to get some food in their belly, if that's helping, but it's not really helping them because it's not going to help them move forward and actually uh, live a life that's not in sin and wickedness before God. Because if you're, if you're not willing to work, then the Bible says that you shouldn't eat. And it is a sin to be slothful and lazy and not willing to do these things. So I'd rather have you right with God, and I'd rather help a person to, to do what's right than just enable them to continue doing wrong. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, see, first of all, understand God's heart for those who are really in need. For people who actually have needs, verse 27 of Proverbs 28, the Bible says, He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. So when I say, you know, there's a trap of, of you know, the government of welfare, it's not because I'm just like, I don't want people to... to have well fare, like to, to fare well, right? I want, I want people to do well. But the system that's set up is designed to enslave people instead of help them. And it's under the guise of help, right? Oh, no, no, just, cut, you know, we'll, we'll supply us. And, they, and they, they, they end up just becoming dependent on government instead of being independent, in being able to provide for themselves and actually turn into people that can help other people, right? So it's not that I'm against the poor at all. In fact, like the Bible says, give unto the poor and you're not going to lack. God will take care of you. Even, you know, if you're able to lend to them, God will, God will take care of you for sure. But look at chapter 29. Here's, here's the key. In Proverbs 29, the Bible says in verse 5, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. So you have people, when they start going into this flattery, watch out because they're setting a trap. Like I said before, you know, people don't just, just be like, Okay, here's a trap. I'm setting a trap for you right here. And just gonna, they're going to lay it out for you and just make it obvious. No, they're going to try to disguise it or hide it. Otherwise, no one's going to fall into the trap. So this trap of, uh, of welfare is disguised in this, oh, we're trying to help you, right? But it's really a trap. Verse 6 says, In the transgression of an evil man there is a snare, but the righteous doth sing and rejoice. Verse 7, The righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. The righteous considers. Do you actually think about, well, what's the cause of the poor? Why is this person poor, and what's going to help them, what cause is going to help the poor to not be poor anymore? So you have to consider the cause. Maybe someone's poor because they're an alcoholic. Well, giving an alcoholic more money doesn't help them. The righteous person could consider the cause and be like, you know what, I need to help you with your alcoholism. I need to help you to, to get out of that sin because your real problem is lying there. It's not lying with just not having money. But see, the wicked, they don't care. They're like, oh, well, you just want more money. Here's some more money, right? If they give him anything. The righteous is going to consider the cause of the poor. So that's why, you know, our church doesn't just give out money. I mean, it's someone who just calls and says, Hey, uh, you know, I need rent. I need this. I need that. I'm on hard times. We don't just go, oh, okay. Here's some money. It's, uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, especially in regards to this, is when, there's, when Peter, I think it's the Apostle Peter is, is in the book of Acts, you know, there's a man asking alms. He says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And he, and he heals him. Right? And that person who is asking for alms, and I'm not, you know, there's nothing wrong in that story with the person asking for alms because he, he, was, he was injured, he was sick, he was, he, you know, 
he wasn't at full capacity, he wasn't capable of working, so he had to ask for alms. But what he does is he actually helps that person greater than just giving him some money. He actually considers the cause and helps him. And when people call here looking for money, you know what's going to help them out a lot more? Is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I tell people, hey, why don't you come and show up to church? Oh, no, no, because that's, that's way too hard. I'd rather just call down this list and try to find some sucker that's going to give me some money and because I think that what I just need is You understand, I just need some money now. I just need to, how is coming to church going to pay my bills? I'm trying to help you. Why don't you come in and seek God? Why don't you have a little bit of faith? Why don't you, you look in what God is trying to tell you and gain some wisdom? And I'll help teach you some wisdom and we'll try guiding you and helping you so that you're not in this situation next month and you're calling more churches because you didn't make your rent again. But no, they don't want that, by and large. Now, the person's, you know, we're going to try to help. We'll consider the cause. But see, the government, they're not considering the cause either. And these problems, they, they, they seem, you know, oh, yeah, it's a good, no, it's not. And it's also not a righteous thing to steal money from someone just to give it to someone else. Robin Hood's not, the story of Robin's not righteous. Stealing from people to give to someone else is not righteous. I know you don't like the rich person, and maybe they are lifted up and full of themselves and wicked people, but that still doesn't make stealing right. Two wrongs don't make a right. But that's what the government's doing with the welfare. You know, they're stealing it from people who have money to give it to people who don't. No, God's method is it's up to you to decide to give to people. Giving to, to, to people who are in need is a good thing in general, right? But at least you have the discernment to be able to look and say, well, what is, what's really going to help them? What is it really that's going to help a person? Other traps. Yeah, I can't get into all these tonight. I'd because we need to finish Psalm 10. I had a couple more on here, but but I'll bring this one up. Planned Parenthood, right? The the birth control is another trap on the poor people, and you don't have to go very far to understand this. With the abortion clinics, the murdering of babies. They try to spin it and go, oh, it's your right. Hey, you have these reproductive rights, and it's your choice. And, you know, you don't need that child draining your life and draining your resources. And you're not ready for this because you're too young. You need to have a career. And we're trying to empower women, and we're trying to help you by murdering your baby, by causing you the, the psychological and emotional damage that's going to come as a result from you actually murdering your baby. Because no matter how much a person wants to try to trick themselves and tell themselves, oh no, it's just some cells. Oh no, this is, there, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing immoral. Why don't you ask the women who have had abortions whether or not that was actually a baby? They all, I mean, unless they're just, just their heart is just completely cold and darkened and, and given over to reprobate mind. I know plenty of women who have had abortions that when they went into it, you know, they had all these people talking in their ear and deceiving them and anything was that big of a deal. But when they actually went through with it, they knew that life that was in them was extinguished and they knew what they had done was wicked and wrong and they don't want to think about it and they don't want to talk about it and, and for good reason because it's, it's wicked as hell. But they've been deceived and lied to and then damaged because wicked people are doing wicked things and setting traps for people. But they play it off as being a benefit. Oh, this is good. No, it's not. It's destroying women. Murdering babies doesn't help anybody. There's a profound statement, right? What kind of crazy world do we live in where you have to make a statement that says murdering babies is not good for you? It's not healthy. It's a bad thing. The world's gone mad. Back to Psalm 10. So 
still talking about the wicked person, verse number 10, he croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by a strong one. So when it says here he humbleth himself, this isn't talking about him humbling his heart. This isn't about talking about him getting right with God and going, hey, I was real proud, now I'm humbling myself. Because the word humbling is just means he brings himself low. This is talking about physically. So when it says he's crouching down, it's talking about like physically crouching down. You think about like a lion, uh, um, some type of predator that's stalking its prey. You know, you think about a tiger or lion. What are they going to do? They're going to crouch down and try to get real low to the ground, try to hide in the grass, right? Like a snake in the grass. They're going to try to hide before they could strike and, and kill their prey because they don't want to be seen. So when it says here, they croucheth and humbleth himself, he's just physically bringing himself low. You know, this is the imagery being brought up in order to destroy. That the poor may fall by his strong ones. It could also be a deceptive tactic too. Oh, I'm not that, you know, I'm humble. I'm meek like you. And he's got his strong ones ready to bite and devour because he's bringing them into the trap. Right? Oh, I'm harmless. Come on in. And my, and my other cohorts will destroy you. Verse 11, he hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. This is the foolishness of someone who's so lifted up in pride, they're just thinking, oh yeah, God's not going to see any of this stuff. Oh, he forgot about that. Yeah, that wicked thing I did when I destroyed that person. Yeah, that God, God doesn't care about those people anyways. Whatever, you know. this, is the, this is actually what goes on in people's mind, and it's, and it's craziness. It's insanity. Verse number 12, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. Because of all this wickedness, all this unrighteousness, the wicked people out to destroy people, it is a righteous thing to call on God and say, God, help us. God, bring judgment on these wicked people that are trying to destroy people, that are destroying the poor. God, bring judgment on them. Amen and amen. You know why? You know one of the reasons why it's a good thing to ask God to bring judgment on these wicked people? Because if God brings judgment on these people, maybe it'll sink in with other people going, oh man, I don't want to do that because I don't want that to happen to me. Ultimately, it's for the greater good. I mean, that's why we have, God gave judgments and punishments on various crimes so that other people would see and fear and do not likewise. So I don't want to do that. Hey, that guy committed adultery on his wife, and he was put to death. I, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like that guy. Verse 13, wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? We're saying, why does the wicked hate? This word, like contempt, contemn God. Why does the wicked hate God? He hath said in his heart, thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it, for thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thy hand. The poor committeth himself unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. This is a comforting psalm. Because even though if, if you're poor, if you're in a position where you don't have an advocate, you don't have someone to speak for you in this world, and you've got enemies and people who are going to try to take advantage of you because you're poor, and they know that they can get away with whatever they want because you can't afford to go out and get some lawyer and sue them if they do you wrong, and that you just have to spend your time working anyway, so you don't have time to fight these battles because you're poor and you just need to keep working, so people can just rip you off, and there's nothing you can do about it, and they know there's nothing you can do about it because you're in that situation you know what we can take comfort because God's gonna watch out for you God will make sure that those right those wrongs are righted praise the Lord thank God that he's a God of justice and judgment so that while you yeah it's not pleasant going through that stuff no one likes being taken advantage of but at least we know that we have a God in heaven that does see these things He's not blind to it. And while you may not see the judgment come immediately or the next day, right, we know it's going to come because God doesn't forget any of it. God sees it and doesn't forget. Verse um, 15. How about this? 
This, you know, and this is a psalm, so people love, you know, how many times have you heard someone say, oh, I just love reading the psalms, <laughs> right? So they're, they're, they're so uplifting, they just help me out. <laughs> Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Amen. I love the psalms too. It's like these people are like, are you reading these psalms? Or do you just kind of skip over these parts? And you just focus in on your favorite psalm, you know, the one that doesn't mention anything about wicked people and being judged. Break thou the arm of the wicked and evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. Amen. Stamp it out. Verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. Again, the goal of having God judge and to hear the fatherless, the oppressed, is so that the man in the earth that's doing the oppressing doesn't oppress anymore. I told you a story about the bully, right? The, the point of, of my brother going and, and socking him was so that he doesn't do that anymore. And it worked. In that situation, it worked. And, and us going to God and asking God for judgment on these wicked people is because we don't want them oppressing anyone anymore. The reason why we want pedophiles put to death is because we don't want them defiling any children anymore. We just want it done and taken care of. Justice served. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. You know, and there's nothing unchristian about it. Hey, we love the lost. We love the sinner. We love the poor. We love the rich. We'll go out and preach the gospel to all of them. We're going to try to help them. We're going to consider the cause and go and bring forth the good news and the gospel of peace. We do that all the time. But at the same time, just as we're not going to take matters into our own hands and just you know, bring forth vengeance and try to right every wrong ourselves, we're going to ask God to step in and take care of the people who are oppressing us and trying to harm us and trying to do evil against us and have God judge that person. Even while we're preaching the gospel to them, God ought to still judge them. And, and look, I've heard this before, and I'm going to close on this, because we're already a little bit over time. I'm sick of people saying, oh, you know, people are so warped. And, and, and when I say people, I'm talking about people who claim to believe in God and the Bible and claim to be believers in Jesus Christ. And I'm saying claim because I don't know their heart. But I see this so many times. They're saying, yeah, but I mean, if you put them to death, but God wants all men to be saved. And if we put them to death, then they can't be saved. What? That is so stupid. Stupid thinking. Enforcing laws is necessary and has nothing to do with a desire to get people saved and wanting people saved and preaching the gospel to people. They're separate from each other. Laws are necessary. Because, I mean, you could make that argument well, what if they're not put to death? Well, what if they're put in a prison, huh? And what if they're put in, in solitary confinement? How are you going to give them the gospel anyway? You know, it's like they don't think these things through at all. Because they won't go as far as to saying, well, yeah, there just shouldn't be any laws. Because that's crazy and stupid. And say, well, I mean, of course things have to be against the law. But what it, what it really is is they just don't like God's judgment. They don't like the death penalty and the things that God says ought to have the death penalty. They don't like that. So they're going to come up with anything they could possibly think of and, and try to say, oh, well, the Bible says that we need, you know. The Bible says who deserves death and who doesn't. And the Bible says, let not thine eye pity or spare in the judgment. And that it is what it is. And the Bible also says the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's true. It's a true statement. But it doesn't, it, it, it's just like saying, you know, God wanted us to be saved, but he didn't just do away with all punishment and judgment. It was still paid. Jesus paid for it. He didn't just throw it out the window. It's not, just, it's, it's not like, like the sins that you've committed just, it's like they didn't happen. Now, for you, it's like they didn't happen.
because you don't get that punishment for it of hell. But to Jesus, it's not like it didn't happen. Because it very much did happen. Because he suffered and died for your sins. It wasn't just poof, gone. God has separated you as far as the east is from the west from your sins. But guess where the sin went? It went and fell on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, who became sin for us. So it, it doesn't just vanish. It doesn't just go away. And when people commit crimes on this earth, you know, yeah, we can be forgiving in one sense. We can, we can want to see people get saved, but there still needs to be that justice and that judgment. It's only right. It needs to be done. God has commanded it and ordained it. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that you give us in Scripture. I pray that you please help us to understand more. Help us to, to see all the patterns in your word and to just uh, receive good doctrine and help us to, to be able to, to reach people. Help us to have the right spirit, the right heart to reach the lost, but to, to stand firm on your words throughout the whole Bible, Lord, to help us to, to be consistent and just uh, increase our, our knowledge and understanding. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to turn to one last song before.